I just want to go over some basics. And I, in order to understand the midterm elections, what they mean, what they portend, uh, it's important to keep in mind that the Republican Party is not only a minority party, but a minoritarian party that has increasingly relied on certain constitutional advantages to maintain its grip on power. I've written about this before many times in the Weekly Worker, but let me just go over it one more time, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, these advantages include an electoral college that favors underpopulated rural white states and, and has allowed two of the last four presidents to enter the White House, both Republicans, without winning the popular vote. Uh, it includes a Senate that is so grossly inequitable that the GOP currently holds 50 out of 100 seats despite representing 45 million fewer people. That's a gap equal to 13.5% or so of the US population. Uh, it includes a House of Representatives in, re in which Republicans have enjoyed an average 10 or 11% advantage since two 2010. Uh, a Supreme Court with a 6-3 conservative majority that is likely to persist well into the 2030s. Of the six conservatives, four were nominated by minority presidents, i.e. Uh, George W. Bush or Donald Trump, and four were confirmed by senators representing a minority of the population. Um, domination of conservative and undemocratic state governments uh, since, two then, since 2010 has given Republicans a free her hand in terms of congressional districting and numerous other policymaking areas that the Constitution reserves for the states, uh, namely policing, educational policy, uh, and now abortion. Uh, and finally, there's a completely and utterly dysfunctional constitutional amending clause in Article 5 that allows 13 states representing as little as 4.4% of the population to veto any and all attempts at constitutional reform. Um, the last is you know, maybe the most important because it's kind of the keystone of the arch. Um, it locks in obeisance to the past, the idea that the job of us the living uh, is merely to conserve freedom granted to us centuries ago by the founding fathers, rather than creating it anew. Uh, it locks in constitutional debates for decades that can only be resolved via a long com and complex process of debate and adjudication, um, all of which serves to reinforce the idea of an unelected Supreme Court as the supreme political, legal, and moral authority. Uh, it places inequality, misrepresentation, checks and balances, and other pre-modern art artifacts beyond criticism and beyond the reach of the, of the population and therefore reinforces passivity. The all too common retort here in the United States that's the way the founders wanted it to be, becomes the all purpose ex explanation for a grossly unrepresentative system of government, uh, which is simply beyond the control uh, of, the, uh, of the current population as it now is. Um, all of which has provided Republicans uh, with a growing advantage despite losing the popular vote in seven out of the least last eight presidential elections. This is what fueled the events of January 6, 2021, which is a desire to make ultimate use of those advantages by launching a takeover on Capitol Hill that would throw the contests into the House of Representatives where Republicans enjoy yet another majoritarian, minoritarian advantage via the 12th Amendment ratified in 1803, which says that in such an event, quote, the votes shall be taken by states, the representatives from each state having one vote. That means that because the Republicans ca uh, control a majority of state re uh, delegations in the House, they would have prevailed even though they don't control a majority in the House overall. 
Um, this would have been undemocratic to say the least, but it would not have been inconsistent with an increasingly undemocratic constitution. Um, but it's more complicated than that. Um, in 1787, when the, when the, uh, the Constitution was, uh, was drafted, uh, i.e. two years prior to the storming of the Bastille, uh, the U.S. was not an anti-democratic country. To the con contrary, it was a pre-democratic country, teetering on the edge of the new age, but afraid of going over completely. Hence, the Constitution is an un ungainly collection of pre- and po post-democratic elements. This is why the country exploded in 1860 to 61, because the tension between the two sides had finally reached a point where the, the contradiction was unbearable. It's why normal political processes uh, came apart in January 21, January 20, 2021, because minoritarian and, and majoritarian tendencies were again at war with one another. Uh, and it's why Republicans suffered such a sharp setback last week, because the oscillations and that long-term process of breakdown and decay temporarily favored the Democratic majority. The, De the Republicans' long-term minority strategy, in other words, finally reached a bump in the road, um, although that's certainly not the end of the story. Uh, but it's more serious than that. Uh, even though the Republicans are still on track to gain a small majority in the House, um, the midterms represented the worst performance by the opposition in at least 20 years. Um, but for explicit election denialists, i.e. those who went into the election touting the Trump line that the 2020 election was stolen by the Democrats and that Joe Biden was illegitimately elected, those election de denialists uh, e fared even worse. Um, of 199 Republican candidates for the House, Senate, Governor, State Attorney General, or State Secretary of State, which is the chief election official, of those 199 um, who went into the race denying the, denying the legitimacy of the 2020 elections and more or, less, more or less of embracing the 2021 Capitol Hill uprising, two thirds um, uh, won their races, 134 out of 199. But of that 134, 65, I'm oh, sorry, 100, 112 out of the 134 were incumbents whose reelection was more or less assured due to gerrymandering. That leaves 87 non-incumbent Republican election deniers. And of them, 61% lost or are projected to lose, along with another nine who are who will probably lose, although, although the vote is still ongoing. That 70 out of 87 appear to be on a losing track. That is a powerful defeat for election denialism. Uh, examples include uh, Carrie Lake, a Trump-backed former TV news anchor or presenter uh, in Arizona, who expected to sail to victory by proclaiming at every campaign stop that the 2020 elections were stolen, but who ended up losing the Arizona governorship by 1.4%. Uh, another example is Blake Masters, a protege of right-wing Silicon Valley billionaire Peter Thiel, uh, who also touted the, uh, the stolen election line uh, and ended up losing to Democrat Mark Kelly for the Senate by 5.7%. Uh, look at Carrie, Trump had, uh, told Masters at one point. She is winning with very little money. 
If they ask her, how is your family? She replies that the election was rigged and stolen. You'll lose everything if you go soft. Unfortunately for Masters, he followed Trump's advice all too closely, uh, touted the stolen election line uh, at every opportunity and wound up losing. A third example is Lauren Boebert, who actually uh, is the exception who proves the rule. She's an ultra-right election de uh, denier uh, from a town in Western Colorado called Rifle. This is, I'm not, I'm not joking, it's called Rifle. She owned a restaurant called Shooter's Grill in which the waiters and waitresses were encouraged, encouraged to, to openly carry guns. She supports QAnon, opposes green energy, abortion, sex education, gay marriage, and immigration. She's a Christian Zionist and a born again fundamentalist who says she's quote, tired of all this separation of church and state junk. Uh, previously, Bobert was regarded as a 90% favorite to win. But while she's still ahead, she's only ahead by a hair thin margin of 0.4%. Again, this is a powerful setback, a powerful repudiation of election denialism. Meanwhile, essentially the same pattern uh, holds for abortion. Last June's Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe v. Wade, the 1973 ruling legalizing abortion nationwide, was a shock given that polls show that support for abortion runs at around 60% nationwide. It was a replay in certain respects of the Dred Scott decision in 1857, which declared that black people have, quote, no rights which the white man is bound to respect unquote, and which needless to say, um, uh, essentially uh, cleared a path for civil war. Um, uh, but as in 1857, the result has been a powerful counter trend. Uh, last August, we saw a dramatic referendum uh, in Kansas rejecting a, a, an abortion uh, uh, ban. Uh, and now uh, last week, uh, we saw voters lock in state, in state constitutional abortion rights in California, Michigan, and Vermont, while also rejecting a ba ballot measure that would have explicitly clarified that abortion uh, did not enjoy state constitutional protection in Kentucky. And Kentucky, by the way, is a deeply pro-Republican state. Um, voters also elected pro-abortion Democrats in Pennsylvania, where Josh Shapiro prevailed against an ultra rightist named Doug Mastriano for governor, uh, and where they had also uh, elected um, uh, um, John Fetterman, a pro abortion Democrat for senator, against uh, Mehmet Oz, a Republican who was anti abortion, and finally elected Dem re elected Democratic Governor Tony Evers in Wisconsin, who was also pro abortion, uh, defeating an anti abortion state legislative candidate uh, and defeating an, uh, an anti abortion state legislative ca candidate as well. And finally, in North Carolina, where uh, Republicans in the state legislature hoped to win a super majority that would lock in an abortion ban. Uh, uh, Democrats uh, or voters stop them in that regard as well. So in both cases, election denialism and the Supreme Court led assault on abortion rights, Republicans trusted that their increasingly militant minoritari minoritarianism would prevail, but it didn't. Democratic elections, to state the obvious, are majoritarian instruments that intrinsically favor majoritarian parties. Hence, they place minoritarian parties at a disadvantage. So the lesson of 2022 appears to be, uh, for Republicans, that if you set out to topple the Democratic majority, 
don't be surprised if come election time, the Democratic majority topples you first. Live by the sword, in other words, die by the sword. Um, Democrats were supposed to lose big time. Uh, thanks to inflation, uh, real wages have declined 4.4% since Joe Biden took office. The conflict in the Ukraine is meeting with a distinctly unenthusiastic response on the part of a war-weary republic. Biden is personally unpopular. But if Democrats held their own, it's because Republicans were even more unpopular and ran into a stone wall. So I see this election as less a vote for Democrats than a vote against Republicans who have adopted an increasingly anti-democratic uh, posture. But that leads to the big question, what happens next? Uh, Republicans are locked into a minority uh, position by a constitution that believes, in, believes that freedom and justice can only be safeguarded by blocking and limiting majority rule, which the founders uh, equated with a mob rule and, uh, and, and uh, majority dictatorship. Um, now that the Trump bubble has burst, they may try to smooth off the rough edges of their program by pulling back slightly on abortion and perhaps dialing down the election denialism. But they're unable to give, in their, give up their built-in structural advantages entirely because after all, the US Constitution says that minority rule is right, just, and sound. And in the US, the Constitution is the supreme political, legal, and moral authority. So it's the Republicans' constitutional duty, in a sense, to make the most of those constitutional advantages, regardless of the consequences at the polls. They're obliged to do the right thing, and the right thing is what they will do, according to their lights. Consequently, the lion will not lie down with the lamb as peace descends on Capitol Hill. To the contrary, the Republicans are likely to gain a small majority in the House, while Democrats simultaneously uh, continue to enjoy 50-50 parity in the Senate which actually works out to a one vote majority since Vice President uh, Kamala Harris also has a vote in what is essentially a 101 seat upper house. Um, uh, and this, by the way, and, the, and Democrats may even expand their majority uh, from 50 to 51 if they win a runoff election in Georgia on December 6th, although that is impossible to predict at this point. Uh, in any way, the result should be even further conflict. Um, today's New York Times, for example, says that as a result, uh, Senate Democrats will be free to mount their own investigations to counter the threatened onslaught from a Republican controlled lower chamber. That means that after January 1st, when the new Congress takes office, we can look forward to dueling investigations as House Republicans impeach uh, Biden on corruption charges due to his son Hunter's business activities, and a, by the way, charges to which he is highly vulnerable, um, while Democrats continue investigating Trump with regard to January 6th and his own business affairs in which he is also highly vulnerable. So we'll see dueling investigations going back and forth. Uh, the Biden administration will be, should be able to appoint federal judges, um, a power that will not affect the Supreme Court unless Sam Alito or Clarence Thomas, the two most senior justices, uh, suddenly keel over from a heart attack, uh, but it will allow them to counter the conservative trend uh, in the lower federal courts. 
Um, but that will merely spur Republicans on to more extreme measures in the House. Um, the GOP will not go gently into that good, good night we can trust, but will rage, rage against the dying of the light. Um, such deep-seated structural tendencies will interact in ever more uh, explosive ways as the capitalist crisis deepens, uh, the war in the Ukraine intensifies, uh, and the prospect of a military clash with China looms. Uh, in response to such developments, the Republican, Republican course is clear. Um, their strategy will be to use their House majority to block the White House, any White House initiatives that they can, to hold up uh, budget measures in return for concessions in other areas, and in general, to promote a cri crisis atmosphere that will keep the entire political system on edge. Um, this in turn will have two effects. Uh, gridlock at home classically causes the White House to take out its frustrations on enemies abroad. Uh, this means that the Biden administration will likely move uh, even more aggressively to counter US, uh, to counter threats to US global hegemony uh, in the Ukraine and in the Western Pacific. That this means uh, ever uh, harder lines against Russia and China uh, and ever more aggressive uh, military postures. Uh, a second effect is that gridlock in Washington uh, will serve to displace political energy to the states, which have emerged since 2010 as prime areas, arenas for political uh, control. Um, with that in mind, it's, uh, it's, it's worth considering a the Supreme Court decision that is scheduled to be heard next month and probably decided next spring. This is a North Carolina case called Harper versus Moore. Uh, which um, involves something called independent state legislature theory, a doctrine holding that based on constitutional, constitutional clauses in Articles 1 and 2, state legislatures have complete and total power to conduct congressional and uh, presidential elections as they see fit in their states and to choose members of the electoral college as they see fit as well, without any kind of input whatsoever, either from governors or from the state courts. That means that if a Republican state legislature wants to appoint or elect pro-Republican electors, regardless of the popular vote, then that's the way it will be. The upshot will be a radical transfer of authority from the people at large to the state legislatures. This actually may be closer to what the founders had in mind in 1787, but it's obviously a, an infinite distance from what we see, uh, think of democracy today. No one knows how the court will rule in Harper v. Moore, uh, but the fact that it chose to hear Harper uh, out of thousands of cases that come its way uh, each year uh, suggests that it is at least sympathetic to the independent state uh, legislative doc doctrine uh, to begin with. So things uh, look favorable to an anti-democratic decision whose consequences will be even more sweeping than the Dobbs decision uh, last June. And needless to say, there will, if that does happen, if the worst does come to pass, to pass there will be nothing the Democrats can do short of appointing new Supreme, uh, Supreme Court justices in the, uh, in the 2030s. I mean, after all, the Democrats swear by the Constitution. 
Uh, they swear it's the holy of holies, and they literally swear by the Constitution because they all take an oath of office to that effect. So they're, they're powerless to respond in any kind of progressive way when the Constitution is turned against them. This is yet another example of live by the sword, by, die by the sword, because it means that democratic constitution worship will not, be, uh, will not serve to uphold democracy, but will be used by the Republicans to bury it. So summing up, I see that I'm ahead of my time, but I guess no one really minds. Um, the 22, 2022 elections were a vote against putschism and dictatorial dictatorship and, and judicial dictatorship. Um, they were a vote in favor of democracy such as it is, but not a vote in favor of democracy as it should be. For that, America requires a revolutionary, reach, re, a lev, revolutionary leap in which the working class decides the question of majority versus minority rule once and for all firmly in, the, in favor of the former. But since the constitution is effectively unchangeable and unamendable due to a dysfunctional amending clause, it is impossible to include, uh, to uh, achieve such a reform via a minor adjustment here or there. The only solution is to tear up the dysfunctional amending clause and install a new constitution by toppling the constitution in its entirety. The working class must install a new constitution in a revolutionary democratic manner, acting in a direct fashion, not in an indirect fashion via an 18th century plan of government. Um, whether that happens, uh, that may not happen in the immediate future, but I am quite confident it will happen uh, before, um, happen sooner than most pundits uh, imagine.